Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you, everyone, for being here both in person in the auditorium today and virtually on Teams. Today, our speaker is one of our hospital hospitalist faculty here at Inova. Today, we have Dr. Larry Israel. He has been a physician at Inova Fairfax for the last five years. He went to medical school at Virginia Commonwealth University and completed his internal medicine residency here at Fairfax as well. He is certified in point of care ultrasound by the Society of Hospital Medicine and has been using POCUS in his clinical practice for the past six years. He has published multiple studies on the utility of POCUS in improvement patient, improving patient care and recently has published a book titled The POCUS Manifesto, arguing that POCUS plays a vital role in saving our patients from unnecessary complications, near misses, and excess testing. We are excited to have him present today, and I will hand the floor over to Dr. Israel. Thank you, thank you. So nice to see people in person instead of on a computer. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to go through a very fast paced and hopefully exciting uh, presentation on why I think POCUS is so cool and why everyone should do it. So um, just some objectives. First, we'll talk about some of the limitations of our current way of diagnosing pneumonia. Um, understand how POCUS works, what it is, and how it can accurately diagnose pneumonia, and then what are the limitations. So if we kind of take a step back and just think about what is pneumonia and to define it, you know, I'm sure, of course, everybody knows what it is, but if you actually try to define it in an all-encompassing way, it's a little challenging. You know, obviously bacterial and viral infections are the most common that we deal with, but there's other kinds as well. So if we look back in history in 1824, Rene Lenec defined it as inflammation of the pulmonary substance. A hundred years later, um, William Osler described it as infection characterized by inflammation of the lung, so about the same. And then fast forward to 2021, 20, uh, this is a physician who's on the editorial board of a journal called pneumonia. So wondered what he would call it. And he said it was any inflammatory process in the alveolar space. So basically the definition hasn't changed in 300 years. Um, so how do we diagnose it? You know, uh, in, in uh, increasing invasiveness, we have, of course, the history, which is very important. We have our physical exam, our stethoscope. We have chest x-rays. We have biomarkers, which we commonly here use procalcitonin, CRP has been used in the past. Of course, we have sputum cultures, which are very important, but the yield is somewhat low. We have CT, which is generally the gold standard, but of course is expensive, has excess radiation exposure, some patients can't lie flat, et cetera. And that's, of course, an outpatient or low resource setting, that's often not an option. And then, of course, there's a bronchoscopy if we really need to and, and biopsy. So if we all just go through a few of these and kind of talk about some of the limitations. So, you know, physical exam, of course, is something we all do. And But if you actually look at what is the sensitivity and specificity, diagnostic accuracy of the things we do, it, oftentimes it's quite surprisingly low. Here's a study where they blinded physicians and had them use their stethoscope to try to diagnose patients with pneumonia and you know and fill out these little forms and basically they were they were not very good their sensitivity was like 60 40 to 60 percent and so is the specificity so they concluded saying the traditional physical exam is not sufficient on its own to confirm or exclude pneumonia and then there was a big meta-analysis a few years ago looking at this in 34 studies and they came basically to the same conclusion sensitivity of 30 percent. Considering the results of this meta-analysis, auscultation can be considered not clinically useful in making the diagnosis. And so this diagnosis, diagnostic uncertainty leads to all sorts of things, as, as I'm sure all of us have experienced, um, especially in the outpatient setting, but patient and clinician burden. I mean, if, you, if a patient comes in with cough and shortness of breath and you ask them to go get a chest x-ray, that could be anything from walking across the hall to driving to another facility, scheduling a x-ray, you know, making a follow-up appointment, coming back, and that's just incredibly unpleasant for everybody involved. 
It causes antibiotic overprescription. So this is well documented. You know, um, if people are unsure what exactly is going on, it certainly could be a bacterial pneumonia, but we don't have good imaging. We're not sure patients has demands, et cetera. And so, for example, in the UK, 80 to 9 percent of the antibiotics prescribed are for upper respiratory infections in the outpatient setting. So that's clearly a huge problem and, and huge opportunity to, to, for improvement. And of course, it leads to antibiotic resistance, and this was shown many times. But in Finland, for example, when they were able to reduce the use of antibiotics, it did result in less resistance. So this is the American Thoracic Society and Infectious Disease Society who uh, came together and had some guidelines on this. And they basically said that, you know, this is frequently diagnosed without an x-ray, though the accuracy of the physical exam is poor and you should have an x-ray as well. So let's talk about the x-ray. You know, as everyone knows, it's kind of a zoomed out snapshot of the chest. Usually just one view, at least in the hospital, AP, sometimes the lateral as well. It has a very low sensitivity for detecting lung consolidations, which I'll argue shortly. Um, you can't see anything behind the heart uh, unless you do the lateral, but you know, getting a lateral often involves sending a patient down with a nurse transport. Um, it takes a long time, it's, it's somewhat burdensome. So usually it's just an AP that's done. And also, there's very has a lot of difficulty figuring out what's going on at the bottom of the lungs. You know, as I'm, as many of you have seen, it will often say atelectasis versus pneumonia versus pleural effusion, which is kind of like saying, you know, it could be anything, you know. So, um, and and so if we look at the actual studies that have compared chest X-rays to CAT scans in in the same patients, it, you you'll see what I'm talking about. So, this is one of 170 patients who had a CT scan that was high probability of a pneumonia and clinical it was a clinical case as well, and 40 of those had a normal chest X-ray. In a in a 900 patient study. Very similar, they found early chest CT resulted in pneumonia diagnosis more than 90% of the time where chest x-ray failed to diagnose more than half the cases. Um, and one in a very rigorous one of 200 patients where they did all sorts of studies and CTs and had a blinded adjudication committee of ID doctors and pulmonologists after the discharge, they found that about 30% of the x-rays missed the, the diagnosis. And this was the biggest one I could find in the radiology literature, 3,400 patients who had a CT and a chest X-ray, and they found that chest X-ray was 43% sensitive. So we're talking about, you know, uh, 43 out of 100 patients with pneumonia were diagnosed with the chest X-ray. The rest were missed. So there's definitely limitations there. And they said it cannot independently rule in or out pneumonia. So what about biomarkers? Well, we have CRP, which, uh, you know, is, as everybody knows, is, is elevated for many different reasons, but it has been used to try to diagnose pneumonia, especially in outpatient. And there's all sorts of kind of point of care tests like this one. Um, and there's been many studies looking at how useful that is, but it's, it's just been all over the board and not very useful. Um, in this particular meta-analysis, they said it was neither sufficiently sensitive to rule out nor specific to rule in pneumonia. So what about procalcitonin? We use this one a lot here. You know, it's a precursor to calcitonin. It's upregulated during inflammatory states and theoretically more, more elevated after bacterial infection. So in theory, it would be useful. But the evidence for it is very mixed. So, for example, in this study of pediatric patients, these are very sick patients patients, many of them were in the ICU ventilated. If you look here, uh, when the procalcitonin was completely negative, it was, uh, there was no typical bacterial infections that was corresponding to that, but there was atypical and viral as you would expect. But as, as you go up just a little bit, you know, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, it's really all, all over the place. And over, over two, you know, there you had 32, you had 26% of them with bacterial and 58% with viral. So if it's completely negative in this study, it would be useful uh, maybe, but if it's not completely negative, it's hard to interpret. 
And then IDSA did a big study uh, in adults and said for procalcitonin over 0.5, how does that predict bacterial pneumonia? And the answer is no. It was 50% sensitive, 76% specific. And you can see that all the studies they included here, the sensitivity was all over the place. Same with the specificity. So they basically said that Procalcitonin level is unlikely to provide information that will enable clinicians to immediately address whether the infection is bacterial and antibiotics need to be administered or whether it's viral and they should be withheld. Um, and in this study I mentioned previously, they also looked at the sensitivity. And so for the procalcitonin, we, the when it turns red and, and epic, it's over 0.1. And so here in this study, they found it was 77% sensitive and 45% specific. So Maybe it's it's somewhat useful, but um, unclear. And so they concluded by saying the predictive value uh, of clinical symptoms in pneumonia patients is poor. CRP and procalcitonin didn't help much. And uh, yeah. So what about lung pocus, lung ultrasound? Um, to understand I, what I think, why I think it's so cool is we, we need to go back to the 1960s when this was just a science fiction um, concept. How is he? Severe heart damage. Signs of congestion in both lungs. Has been a key tool for here. Played by Sidney Gallifagi. Oh, sorry. Severe heart damage. Signs of congestion in both lungs. Evidence of massive circulatory collapse. The powerful, compact medical scanner has been a key tool for the science fiction doctors of Star Trek. From Bones and Crusher to Bashir played by Sidi Gelfadil. I should think the tricorder will be a real thing in, in the future, a diagnostic device which is really based on scanning. Um, uh, how on earth they're going to do that is for them to work out. So, you know, this was 1968 and they, they waved a probe across somebody's chest and they immediately could tell what was wrong with his heart and his lungs. And that's, I mean, that's literally what we do every day with POCUS, which is so cool. Um, so what is lung pocus? This is Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein. He's kind of one of the pioneers of lung ultrasound and, and whole body ultrasound. Um, this is a great picture of him doing lung ultrasound and teaching some people. So I think about it as just internal organ ins inspection. It's That's all it is. It gets a lot of criticism from some people, but it's literally you go to the doctor with knee pain and they should look at your knee. You go to the doctor with shortness of breath, they should look at your lungs. I mean, it's as simple as that. But it's about incorporating lung ultrasound into your physical exam in addition to or in place of the stethoscope. And it gets you immediate answers at the bedside that can dramatically change how you treat the patient, rule things out, rule things in, appropriately order echoes, appropriately order CTs instead of just willy-nilly ordering them. And it can get you these things in accuracy similar to CT for most but not all pulmonary diseases. All right, so just to understand how it works, we're just going to go quickly through the physiology. So if you take a piece of the lung and you zoom in a little, you'll get a lobule and you get these alveolar sacs and around collection of alveolar sacs, you get this interlobular septae and there's kind of connective tissue around them. And if you zoom in further to that, you get the alveolus. So if you look at the alveolus, you know, there's the, the blood cells around it. There's the air, the air, um, how the air is exchanged in here. And in between, there's a tiny little space called the interstitial space, and it has a small amount of fluid that's normal in there. And when you get pulmonary edema or pneumonia or anything that causes fluid or cells or anything to build up in the lungs, I'm oh, sorry, let me go back one minute. So when you have a normal alveolus like this, uh, you get an ultrasound that looks like this. So you have connective or um, subcutaneous tissue, you have ribs here and here, and the first nice bright line you see is, is the pleural line. That's actually the parietal and visceral pleura rubbing against each other, back and forth against each other like two uh, glass, gl pieces of glass under a microscope. And, and what you get is this kind of um, artifact, which is called an A-line, which is a reflection of the pleural line equidistant from the pleural line to where the probe is sitting. So it's like when you go to a department store and you're sitting and you're trying on some jeans and you're looking in those those three mirrors and you see an infinite number of you and you're all equidistant from each other. It's the same exact concept. So this is the sign of a normal lung. This is like when you listen with your stethoscope and you hear normal breath sounds, okay? 
So you see here that there's movement, which you may not be able to appreciate. That's called lung sliding. And you see these nice horizontal reflections. So that's normal. And so if you get pneumonia or pulmonary edema, this extravascular lung water starts to build up and exits from where it's supposed to be into the alveolus, into other places, into the interlobular septae, and they get distorted and the alveoli don't like that very much. So um, it, gets, it goes from this nice smooth interlobular septa and pleura to this nice thickened and irregular one. And so you'll see a different image on the ultrasound. And this is kind of a phenomenon you see when there's air and water or air and fluid mingling. And instead of that nice horizontal, which you can kind of see over here, A line, you get these vertical projections and they're coming down from the pleural line. So you see the, the pleural is still moving back and forth when they breathe, but now you're having these horizontal projections. And three or more in a rib space is abnormal. And and you can look at the pleura as well and get some clues as to what's going on. So if it's nice and smooth and regular, that's more consistent with like pulmonary edema or non-infectious or cancerous fluid or consolidation. Whereas if it's really irregular, thickened, there's chunks bitten out of it, as we'll see later, that's more consistent with infections, cancers, pulmonary fibrosis, things like that. And so how does this correspond to a CT? Uh, it's these are kind of like the ground glass opacity. So this is a nice image I found of partially filled alveoli with stuff, whether it's fluid, pus, cells, whatever it may be. You get this kind of net gray appearance and this hazy ground glass opacities. All right. And the way radiologists would describe it is increased lung density not associated with obscuring the underlying vessels. All right. So this is non-specific, so but it's it's fluid of, of some kind. And then as it progresses, you get the alveoli fill with pus, fluid, cells, whatever it may be, and it turns more white, and you see this nice, dense consolidation. And you can actually see these little air pockets here, which are the tiny bronchi and some air trapping, and these are called air bronchograms, which, which are important on ultrasound as well. And so here the vessels are obscured, and so they call it a consolidation. And if you look at an ultrasound, you can also see it. So this is a nice example of a patient with a really dense consolidation. So this is on the patient's right side, down here towards his feet, and this is his liver, or yeah, liver or spleen, depending on which side you're on. This is the diaphragm, and so right above it, you can see this really dense thing that looks exactly like the liver, and this is a good example of why they call it hepatization, because it, it looks exactly like a liver. So, and you can see these bright white dots in here, and those are the air bronchograms. Now, these ones are static, they're not moving, and I'll talk about why that's important. But so um, there's a spectrum of what pneumonia looks like on ultrasound, and that's why I think it's a little challenging, but there's not that many uh, items on the spectrum here. So this is the normal lung, like I showed you before, the nice straight pleural line with a nice horizontal reflection, the A line here, okay? And so if you have a ground glass opacity or some sort of viral pneumonia, you can get something like this. And so what you're seeing here is the, the pleural line here sliding back and forth. You have lots of bright white B lines coming down and you have some irregularity of the pleura, which you may not be able to appreciate from down there. But you can also have something very similar, but you can now have a subpleural consolidation. So this is like a uh, less than one centimeter hypoechoic or darker than the area around it consolidation. And you can see behind, behind that consolidation is nice bright and white, and so that's called acoustic enhancement. Basically, it's a when the ultrasound waves travel through this dense tissue, the posterior side is brighter. And it's very irregular, which you would expect in some sort of infection, cancer, something like that. And then you can have bigger ones, of course. This one is greater than two centimeters. And this one, now you can see it has a nice bright posterior wall like I, the other one. And it has these white dots in here. And um, I don't know if you guys will be able to see, but right in here when the patient breathes in, there's a little dot that moves up and down, up here and down. So that's called a dynamic air bronchogram and that's fluid and um, fluid stuck in the air, air bronchogram that 
moves when they breathe, and that, as we'll see, is, is a sign of pneumonia versus atelectasis. And then you can have, like we saw earlier, this really dense consolidation. So let's talk a little more about this one. So like I said, pneumonia looks like a hypoechoic subpleural consolidation. So under the pleura, it's dark, it has white spots in it, and potentially moving white spots. So this is called the shred sign, which is the posterior irregular border with bright whiteness to it, the enhancement. It can be of different sizes, of course, and, and this is not a definitive cutoff, but as I'll talk about in a bit, if they're less than one centimeter, it's, it tends to be more consistent with a viral infection. If it's greater than two, it tends to be more bacterial, but of course there's, that's not a definitive border. Um, and then the, I said the air bronchograms, the bright spots that could be static or dynamic moving. The dynamic air bronchograms in a famous study in ICU patients, they show that it was very, very specific for pneumonia versus atelectasis, but pneumonia can have either static or dynamic. And so how, can you use POCUS to differentiate viral versus bacterial? Somewhat. Um, so this is a, a study of kids with pneumonia, and on average, the ones that had viral pneumonia, the mean diameter of the consolidation was much smaller, 15 millimeters. There was multiple consolidations in the majority of patients, and it was bilateral in the majority. Whereas for bacterial, it tends to be bigger, 30 millimeters in diameter, median, and, and generally on one side. But of course, again, these are, these are not definitive cutoffs here. And this was seen in a acute study here of children during one of the H1N1 outbreaks uh, where they, they looked for evidence of viral versus bacterial pneumonia as kind of screening in the ED. And here you can see, uh, this is the pleural line. Here's a tiny rib space, another line, so that's pretty normal. And here you can see this kind of divot here, this triangular divot, and that's the subpleural consolidation with these brightness behind it. So that's more consistent with the viral infection, whereas this one in this child was was quite big, and there's bright white spots, air bronchograms, more consistent with a bacterial infection. And so this is uh, just an example from COVID. This is kind of more typical of a viral infection. You get these peripheral patchy um, haziness, uh, and, and you'll see on ultrasound, they look like these bright, the bright B lines, whereas where you get, you can get this bacterial very dense consolidation. But of course you can have dense consolidations from COVID, you can have ground glass opacities. So again, this is not a definitive difference, but. And so if you look at the different studies that have been done on POCUS lung ultrasound, just to see how accurate is it a diagnosed pneumonia, it's extremely accurate with some caveats. So in the pediatric population, it's, it's I would say, uh, as good as a CT, or at least very close to as good as a CT. In ICU patients, it's been shown to be extremely good ED as well. Now, you know, when doing these studies, and I just completed one, which I'll talk about, it, it, of course, the who you decide to include in the study really can affect the accuracy of your results. So most of these studies, they said, we're only going to include patients who come in with cough, fever, shortness of breath, consistent with a clinically consistent with pneumonia. And some of them don't enroll patients that have other pulmonary disease like pulmonary fibrosis, things that can give you false positives, as we'll talk about. So in all these, they tended to do that, just that. They had basically younger, healthier patients, not with pulmonary fibrosis or lung cancers. And in those populations, this sensitivity and specificity is very, very high. In these two, they included patients with pulmonary fibrosis and other non-infectious diseases, and as you can see, the, since the specificity drops. So what are some limitations, false positives? Well, the, the abnormality you're looking for has to touch the pleura. So if it doesn't touch the pleura, you aren't going to be able to see it. Now, most consolidations in various studies, the vast majority of them do, either directly or indirectly, and so you are able to detect them. You may not be able to visualize them as well as a CT, but um, if, if the patient has pulmonary edema, this is a very, very common we see all the time, they're going to have those B lines, those vertical B lines, but the pleura tends to be very smooth and regular. And of course, there's other things on the exam that would point you towards edema and not pneumonia. 
So you can look at their jugular vein, you can look at volume status, you can look if their heart function is normal or abnormal, you can look for pleural effusions. So for example, this is a patient with pulmonary edema, and they have this nice smooth pleura, and they have beeline. So this is more consistent with pulmonary edema, whereas this is a very zoomed in ultrasound on a linear probe, which is a different probe for superficial structures. And you can see really nicely here, this, this pleura is very irregular. Um, so this is more consistent with a viral infection or maybe pulmonary fibrosis. What else? So pulmonary fibrosis is a big one. Uh, it can look very much like a pneumonia, but it has very, very abnormal pleura, and it can have subpleural consolidations as well. So um, they tend to not have pleural effusions, although, of course, you could also have CHF and have pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and then other issues that I have dealt with in our study, we had lung scarring, sarcoid, pulmonary contusion, pulmonary infarcts, lung cancers, which all are going to confound your results. So I recently completed a study, and I we, we asked the question of can you how good can you be with a the cheapest probe on the market, connects to your phone, it fits in your pocket, the resolution is relatively low to compared to the other ones. How sensitive can it be? How many how can you how many pneumonias can you pick up? And so I decided to enroll any patient with a BMI under 35 for any reason, getting a CT of a chest for any reason. And I was completely blinded to the reason. So I didn't know if it was a CTA. I didn't know if it was a CT chest. I didn't know if they were here for a car accident or pneumonia or whatever it may be. And I just wanted to check to, to kind of isolate the sensitivity of this probe and without knowing anything about the patient. All right. And so the basic way you do it is you just have to look at all the parts of the lung in some way. There's there's many different protocols. This is the one I decided to do because it was simple. You divide the, each lung into six parts, two in the front, two on the side, two in the back. And then you put the probe in somewhere on the lung here, and then you just have you slide it up, down, left, right. You're trying to just, you know, see most of the lung and, try, and they're looking for any abnormalities. Then you go down here, and you go to the side, you go posterior. And that's that's really how, how you do it. It takes five to ten minutes. And so in this study, I found that with that probe, it was 94% sensitive and it had a negative predictive value of 96. So in other words, you take 100 patients with respiratory symptoms who have pneumo from pneumonia, you'd pick up 94 out of 100. Um, and then if the exam was normal, if you looked all 12 zones, there was no evidence of pneumonia, you can say with 96% negative predictive value, there's no pneumonia, which is pretty good compared to the other ones we were looking at earlier. And as I mentioned, when, 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 if you don't exclude pulmonary fibrosis, lung cancer patients, things like that, you're going to get a lot of false positives, which is why you see here the specificity is quite low. And I'm going to show you some of those cases. So just really quickly to go over like how I thought about it doing it. So you look over here, if there's A lines in lung sliding in all 12 zones, um, pneumonia is likely, very unlikely to be present. You know, there's still a possibility there's there's a pneumonia inside the lung that is not touching the pleura, but it's it's under 5%. Okay, do you see three or more B lines in one or more lung zone? Is the pleura thick and irregular? No, then it's likely pulmonary edema. You should look for other, uh, you know, um, cardiogenic causes. Is their EF reduced? You can look at their all their veins. Um, so in that case, pneumonia is unlikely. But the caveat to that is if, if, if your probe is, if you can't see the pleura very well, you can't quite determine if it's very smooth, you may, you may, you may not, you may miss something. But, and in this case, if, if the pleura is thick and irregular, it's more likely to be a, a viral pneumonia. But of course, there's, there's, there's some confounding to that. It could be pulmonary fibrosis. It could be lung cancer. Um, and then if you see a consolidation, in, in, in this study, what, the way I figured it out was if it's less than one centimeter and there's multiple of them, it's probably a viral pneumonia. If it's an isolated one with hardly any perturbation around it with the B lines, then it's likely a nodule or something not relevant. 
And if it's greater than two centimeters, especially if it's la unilateral with air bronchograms, it's more likely to be bacterial. Okay, so that's just kind of a basic way how I thought about it. Okay, so I just wanted to go through a few cases which I think are very revealing for the strengths and weaknesses of, of lung ultrasound. So this is a patient uh, with history of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, he was admitted to the psychiatric unit and medicine was consulted for hypoxia. So basic labs, afebrile, white count, normal, procalcitonin elevated. So, and, and just a note, this is after the fact. When I went into the room, I was completely bited. I didn't know what was going on with the patient. So if we look in a blinded fashion at this CT, um, we, we put the ultrasound probe on the patient's back here and here, okay? So this one is the right scapular region. And what do we see? We see subcutaneous tissue. Then we see this hypoechoic space here. It's about one centimeter this way and two, three centimeters this way. And then you see posterior enhancement. So this, I would say, this looks like a lung consolidation. Um, and then over here, you see these focal B lines, so bright B lines coming down, and you'll see some disturbances of the pleura. So this looks like some sort of pneumonia, ground glass opacity. This looks like a consolidation, and this is what it corresponds to on the CT. So it's really useful, I think, to see them next to each other. So you can see this kind of lateral appearing consolidation, which corresponds to this part right here. All right. And here it's a lot less dense, and so you're not getting a consolidation. You're getting just this disturbance of the pleura. Okay, so this was a patient, uh, 92, admitted for hy hypoxia with coughing episode, normal procalcitonin, normal white count, normal, normal test otherwise. And so A lines everywhere. The lung was nice and normal, except when we got down here to the left posterior base. This is the scapular region. So you can see, um, one second. It's very, it's very abnormal here. There's like divots in it. There's bright B lines. So that's kind of giving you a hint. This is very abnormal here. And uh, in this patient, I actually switched it to the abdominal preset, which is just a way to look at the lung in a different way. And you can see they had a nice big consolidation. So it was here, here's the diaphragm, here's the spleen, and this right here is the the con condensed lung with bright dots, which are the air bronchograms, and that corresponded to this CT. All right, here's a, another uh, true positive. Uh, so this was 73-year-old with hypoxic respiratory failure, afebrile, white count nine, procalcitonin negative. Chest X-ray was kind of indeterminate. And so this patient, let's see, so this patient, we're looking at the front, and over here on the right, we see not much. We see A lines. Over here, we see A lines. So that's pretty normal. Then we look at the back. And again, we see these bright B lines. We see the dense irregular tissue consolidation here as well as here. And so that corresponded to this CT. So very dense consolidations here. All right. So like I said, there are limitations. And if, if the pneumonia does not touch the pleura, you may not be able to see it. And so this is an ex the one false negative I had was this patient here with uh, shortness of breath, dyspnea, normal labs, chest x-ray was normal. And uh, it looked relatively normal even on the posterior side here. He had um, these horizontal pleural line and he had the A lines here as well as here. And the pneumonia was red. It was somewhat subtle, I would say. Here's what the CT looked like. And it was red as endobronchial mucus plugging with mild patchy bibasilar airspace opacities, which may reflect pneumonia. So it's, it's, there's all sorts of tricks and, and issues I've discovered doing this is like, what exactly does may mean, you know? Does that mean there is a pneumonia or not? How am I supposed to say if I was right or wrong if it says may? So there's lots of issues with these diagnostic accuracy tests. And I want to show you a few more. So this was a 32-year-old person who came with right-sided pain with inspiration. Again, I was blinded to this information and to the labs and everything. I just walked in and said, oh, will you enroll in this study? And so... This person was nice enough to do so. And so I'm looking at her left lung over here, and it looks nice and normal. 
and they have the horizontal A lines. And I'm looking over here, and then suddenly there's a very focal area of very bright B lines, and the plural looks nice and normal. So I wasn't sure what to make of that. I, I thought it might be a pneumonia or some sort of focal injury pneumonia. And so this is what it looked like on the CT. And sure enough, this patient was actually in a car accident, and so that was a pulmonary contusion. But just to show that it looks very much, could very much be a pneumonia in the right clinical context. Um, so this is another one, 60-year-old shortness of breath, afebrile, COVID and flu were negative, white count pretty normal, procalcitonin negative. Let's see, so this one, oh, okay. So this one, um, I'm looking at his left lung here, A lines, a uh, plural line, A line. So this side looks normal. And this side you see irregular pleura and focal B lines. Okay, so this patient's here with shortness of breath. I'm assuming this may be a pneumonia, potentially viral pneumonia. But sure enough, he actually has pulmonary fibrosis that's much more affecting his right lung than his left. So clearly this is a a something you can't really differentiate with lung ultrasound as far as I know. Um, okay, so this is another one, uh, motor vehicle accident, came in with slightly elevated procalcitonin, white count normal. And his lungs look, look fine everywhere except for right here, I get to this thing. And so we see uh, irregular pleura, B lines, and you see there's like a circular, almost one centimeter thing here. Um, and so it turns out there was, it corresponded to this. So I don't know if that was, it might have been a cystic lung, but he had uh, some what looked like inflammation here, but the radiologist didn't comment on it. So, so I want to show you a couple quote unquote false positives, which I thought were very revealing as well. So this patient was 91 immunosuppressed here with fever, shortness of breath. And she was febrile, white count slightly elevated, influenza COVID negative, chest X-ray pretty much negative. And um, I'll show you the CT first. Um, so looks pretty normal there. There's some haziness at the bottom, but the read was no consolidations, non-specific peripheral linear opacities unchanged from prior CT. Pulmonologist who saw the patient at the time thought there was no pneumonia on CT. And I was enrolling this patient and, you know, again, blinded to what was going on. And her whole posterior lungs were very, very, looked very, very abnormal. I mean, she had very bright B line. She had irregular pleura on, on multiple different posterior fields. The patient looked very uncomfortable when I saw her. And so I just out of, out of kind of, due diligence of enrolling patients in the study. This is a more zoomed in view. I just uh, messaged the, the and, and so it, you know, it probably corresponded to these tiny changes here, although I thought it was quite subtle and not clear. But I messaged the attending, I said, hey, just so you know, this patient's enrolled in a lung ultrasound study and it was very abnormal. To me, it looked like either viral or pulmonary fibrosis but I don't know anything about the patient, so just just FYI. Sure enough, two days later, she was positive for human metanumovirus, and that was her discharge diagnosis. So in this case, to me, it felt like the lung ultrasound was actually better, at least more obvious of what was going on. Um, and here's another interesting one. So this one, 43, no medical history coming in with like classic viral syndrome and her son had just in, in influenza A. So, you know, pretty obvious what's the likely diagnosis, but she had negative influenza, negative COVID, negative everything, but a pretty, pretty persistent cough, very uncomfortable and chest X-ray was normal. And so I was ultrasounding her and here, nice and normal, um, plural line, lung sliding and A lines. Now over here, I saw this, this is like a, if we measure it on this side here, it's about a one centimeter subplural consolidation, irregular border, B lines. Okay, that's, that's interesting. And then here again, down here, saw kind of the same thing, very irregular plura, B line, subplural consolidation. So that's two less than one centimeter consolidations with B lines. My first thought was, okay, that's probably a viral pneumonia and it makes sense in retrospect. So this was her CT. 
I mean, it was very normal and it was read as completely normal. But if you look very closely here, there is a tiny little thing here and a tiny little thing here. Now, that's what the lung ultrasound corresponded to. So, I mean, I'd imagine most people would see that and say that's nothing. But, you know, in this clinical contest, to me, that was maybe a resolving influenza pneumonia. But I guess we won't know for sure. So, in summary, I think lung ultrasound is a very powerful tool to diagnose most pulmonary disease on your physical exam with accuracy close to a CT in some cases. Um, but there's many confounders you need to be aware of, like pulmonary fibrosis, lung cancer. Um, so, yeah. Any questions? Dr. Ishrael, thank you so much for being here today. That was an awesome presentation. Um, for anyone in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, we have these wireless microphones that we'll pass around. For those in the virtual uh, setting, I will allow you to unmute yourselves. And also feel free to uh, put any questions in the chat and we'll read off. Larry? Yes. Congratulations. I think this was Thank a phenomenal you. presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I have been doing lung ultrasound for over 20 years, and I still learned something today from you. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and thank you and for thank correlating. You for correlating. Thank you for correlating the uh, CT and the ultrasound findings. It's something that I've long been suspicious of, is that uh, clinically, clinically I find... I find that that sorry about sorry the echo. about the echo. Clinically, I find that, I find the, that uh, the ultrasound, ultrasound seems, to seems to correlate better with, with what I'm seeing what I'm on, the seeing on the patient mm. and how they and respond, how they to, respond therapy. to therapy. And so, and so you, know, you know, I think you've been, a little, been a little harsh, harsh on yourself. On yourself. Because you, because published, you that published that study, study. Uh, uh, in, actuality, in actuality, if you just, if you focus, just focus on one on diagnosis, one diagnosis then, then it makes sense, sense that the specificity, that the specificity drops. drops. But the sensitivity is very high, high for multiple, multiple different, different diagnoses. diagnoses. What, right. you know, we, you know, we've got to hark back, back to our back classical, to our classical uh, uh, training, training and say, and say we can't we anchor on a diagnosis, like this was a pneumonia study. So of course, if you're looking for pneumonia, the specificity of that diagnosis drops if you've got other conditions. But the sensitivity for finding those abnormalities is quite high. Quite high. So, so I think, I, think uh, uh, I just don't I want just people, don't want people to, to judge this unfairly. This unfairly. Uh, I think it's, I think it's actually, actually extremely helpful. helpful. Um, um, and, and more so, more than, so than perhaps we get prepared for. Prepared for. So, of so, course, I'm a POCUS champion just like you, and I'd rather people started to adopt this. So thank you again for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. of course, I didn't touch on all the other things like pulmonary edema and... and Plural effusion, looking at the looking heart, at the heart lung, lung, you know, just, you know, looked at it more of like, like how like do radiologists read this, read this without knowing without anything. anything? But of course, but of as, course you said, as you said, you look and it will say, oh, say, oh, it's not pneumonia, it's, not it's this. this. And then you can look you can at look all at sorts of other things, things to help with the diagnosis. Looks like there's a few questions in the chat. How do you do quality assurance with focus? <laughs> well, well, there's, there's, there's a, good a, good question. a good question. Um, um so, so the first the question, question I would pose, I would pose back, back to you is how, how do you do quality, quality assurance, assurance with, with lung auscultation? I mean, the answer, I mean, the is, answer you don't. is you don't. We just assume people, people know how to do it and that what they're listening to is correct. And even and if they're even doing if they're it doing incorrect, it's correct, it's very, very inaccurate. inaccurate. So that's the first, so that's the first part. part. Second, Second is, is, yes, uh, if, uh, if we're going to say people should do people this, should do this they, need they need to be trained and they need to have proven their proficient. Their proficient. So there's so various there's certifications, certifications you can complete. And in fact, we're working on one in-house, hopefully, soon that people can scan, get feedback, get approved, and then do it themselves. And then also, and then also how, much how much time does this, time does this take? Can you get can paid? You get paid? <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I would say, I would say in, in, a in, young, in a young, in, in, in a patient, patient that's, that's mobile, mobile in bed, bed that can sit up, can sit up um, that's um, not that's too, not obese, too obese, obese, you know, you, you know, can do you the, whole the whole lung scan in probably five minutes, five minutes. Um, um, or less, or maybe, less three maybe three minutes. minutes. Um, um, you know, you know if they're having they're trouble, having trouble rolling, rolling to their side, if they need help they need standing help up, standing obviously, up, that, obviously takes that takes time. You gotta unbutton the gun, you gotta, you gotta put the gel on them, you gotta wipe the gel off. So it takes, it takes me, it probably me, takes, it probably five, takes minutes five minutes or less. Or less. And then, and um, then um, can you get paid? The answer is yes, if you 
have the images, have the images documented, if you documented if you have an indication, have an indication there's like there's limited, like limited focus, focus building code, building code you, can you can implement. implement. Larry, thanks, Larry so thanks so much for the, for the, the awesome, the awesome talk, talk, and, talk and both to both you and the same for really taking, really taking on being on such champions, champions of this. Of this. Um, um, really, really kind of next, kind of next, next, next level, level, next stage, next stage um, um, a diagnostic, diagnostic tool. tool. Um, um, I was thinking, I was about, thinking about kind of what you were bringing up with the diagnostic challenges with pneumonia in general. And it reminded me of when I was in training the challenges, the challenges with pulmonary, with pulmonary embolism, embolism diagnosis. diagnosis. And, and when I was when in I residency, was in residency there, was really there was really the shift, shift of, the of the literature that, literature that went from IOPED data, data, which was which looking was at sensitivity specificity, specificity of our different, of our different imaging, imaging modalities, modalities for diagnosing, for diagnosing pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, embolism to the seminal, the seminal outcome, outcome study, study, which was a which trial was a called the Christopher, Christopher trial, trial that was published, that was published in JAMA that looked at what are the outcomes of patients treated with, with a diagnostic, the diagnostic paradigm, paradigm using d dime and, and, and CT angiography for recurrence of pulmonary embolism in, 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 in three months. And that and really, that I, really felt I felt like, like for me, at my level, at my level um, um, was, seminal was seminal in understanding, in understanding okay, okay, how can how I can use I diagnostic, diagnostic studies, studies effectively, effectively to then inform, inform treatment, treatment with, confidence with confidence that I'm not that I'm going not to under-treat the disease process. So I'm so curious, I'm from, curious the, from the, the POCUS the literature, literature with where we are with pneumonia, pneumonia. Are, you are you aware of any outcome, any outcome studies, studies that have that used have POCUS or some or combination, some combination of, POCUS of POCUS with, with other, diagnostic other diagnostic information, information. <laughs> with, <laughs> with the decision, the decision to, either to either treat with antimicrobial, with antimicrobial therapy, 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 not treat with antimicrobial, with antimicrobial therapy, therapy, and then what, and then the, what outcomes the outcomes of those patients are or the likelihood of Becoming, becoming infected, infected again, again in 90, in 90 days, days, days or anything like that. I mean, I've definitely seen ones where they track the progress of the treatment and show that every day it gets, the, they measure the size and shrink, you know, on a treatment. treatment. I don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, this, you know is, this, this is this is primarily, primarily a diagnostic, diagnostic tool and secondary, and secondary a, a, a outcomes, outcomes measure. measure. So, so like it's like, you like, know, you get a CT because it, it, it reduces, reduces hospital, hospital stay. No, stay. no, we get usually it because we, get it because we don't know what's we don't going, know what's on. going on. We need to see high resolution, high resolution what's, going what's going on. So I don't so, know. Those, I don't are, know. those really are hard, really hard studies, and, studies and, and, and maybe saying can come and after this. After this uh, but, um, but the other thing is, like in a hospital setting, you know, they always bring this up. Oh, reduce length of stay with POCUS, etc. But you think about like, you know, there's five doctors seeing a patient. There's a million other barriers. The POCUS is this one tiny portion of it. So, yeah, I don't know if Hussein has any other thoughts. I think that, that, that what I suggest is 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 what I you know, you can do studies on whether stethoscopes scopes are effective. And if you have paradigm with that, you can certainly use the ultrasound for that. We use the ultrasound to monitor if the paradigm model is getting better with antimicrobials and diuresis, so we can that this is getting worse. We use it to see how good the pulmonary edema got. We use it to see, oh, this looks like a valid uh, pneumonia. And we frequently see that in the ICU, by the way, where the CT looks negative. But I'm convinced based on ultrasound, this is an effect. And actually, it turned out to be doing better neurovirus for patients. <laughs> So it, it's interesting, as an HIV patient with human medical health, hmm. same, same picture you just showed. Hmm. CT, hypoxic is all get up, and the ultrasound was positive for pneumonia, and that patient got treated for it. So watch out to the map. So, so what I would say is that I've used the ultrasound kind of like an expanded stethoscope, and it has really helped me monitor and be much more precise in my treatment. Um, I have not run into the trouble of making false diagnoses with it. Um, and I draw a parallel. I know this is an ultrasound of the lung talk, but to the heart. When we first started doing focus for the heart, there was a lot of commentary from cardiologists that said, oh, this is going to just result in increase, you know, this going to... A, take our business. We won't be doing echoes anymore. B, you'll be finding things that we don't need to look at. This has been looked at in studies now, and it is actually shown to reduce inappropriate 
ordering of echoes and increase the confirmatory uh, echoes uh, and TEs for finding actual pathology. Uh, so, you know, it's like you doing a better physical exam. And in terms of timing of the study, if you look at our butterfly platform where we store our studies, Adi Kasarbada had asked this question, and I my response to him was, I don't know how long it takes. I feel like it takes a very little bit of time. But Adi said, look, your times are listed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he actually timed it. It's, it takes me five minutes to do an entire body ultrasound, heart, lungs, abdomen, five minutes from beginning of the study to the end of study, because I'm fluent. And if you do this, and if you use this, you realize you're using less time to examine organs with an ultrasound machine than you are with your hands and your ears. So I am a big proponent because it makes my life functionally much more efficient. I spend more quality time with the patient. The patient is looking at their pathology and is invested. Their satisfaction goes up by an order of magnitude. And I feel like my physical exam gets a lot more sensitive and specific. Yeah, I want to say uh, Hussein was really the kind of my mentor and who really got me excited about this. And there's this concept I wrote about in the book called the po kiss. It's a P-O dash K-I-S-S. It's like, you know, your first kiss when you really understand what it is. And and my first po kiss was I was in the ED admitting a patient and uh, before I knew what I was doing. And then Hussein walks in because they had also consulted the ICU because this was a young patient who was tacky to the 120s and hypotensive. And, you know, I was like in the computer, order echo, do this, do that, do this, do that. And then he walks in with the machine five minutes later. Okay, we've looked at the heart, we looked at the lungs, we looked at the IJ, we looked at this, we looked at that. I'm like, whoa, that's cool. And so, you know, you just get the information immediately and it, yeah. Dr. Marshall, you have your hand up in the uh, in Teams. Still on. You need to unmute yourself, Dr. Marshall. Hey, uh, I had a question about. So you do have someone in the office, and you made the diagnosis of bacterial pneumonia. Uh, what all do you do to uh, identify the organism? Uh, do you do a urine test uh, for pneumococcal antigen if you can't get sputum, or do you, or uh, what all do you do? Or do you, uh, you um, are, or, and given that, do you just treat them for community acquired pneumonia? I'd imagine. I'd imagine I mean, if you, I mean, if you actually, you actually, Dr. Morris, Dr. Morris, can you can microphone, 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 please. please. I'd imagine. I mean, if you actually see the evidence of bacterial pneumonia with ultrasound you would just treat for you know five to ten days i have never seen a urine antigen positive ever in my experience here so i i don't know if if you guys in the id do it as an outpatient but i imagine if you can't get a sputum just kind of treat empirically for a week or so thank you Dr. Gerber asks, have you done longitudinal studies and have any data about how quickly consolidation resolves? Yeah, I mean, they've, I've definitely seen ones where they scan the patient every day on antibiotics and, and can show every one to two days at the shrinks in size. Of course, that's assuming that you're correctly diagnosed a bacterial pneumonia and giving antibiotics. Um, so I'm sure it depends a lot on what, what it is. But, but yes, for, for both for pulmonary edema, they've shown that if you... The number of B lines increase as they get more fluid overloaded and the extravascular lung water increases and vice versa. They disappear in proportion to how much fluid there is. So, Thank you. All right, last call for any last minute questions. Okay, Dr. Ishrael, thanks again for being thank here. That you, was an thank awesome you so presentation. much.